So growing up, the kitchen was the heart of our family gatherings. We'd sit at the table and we would watch my grandmother cook and listen to her wisdom. She often said, we're going to the poorhouse. I didn't know where that was, but it sounded scary. <laughs> and she said a lot of scary things that made me wonder about my future and was I going to be happy. So where did she get her stories and beliefs? And she got them from my lineage. My great-great-grandmother was brought to the U.S. from Indonesia as a slave. She was raped by the plantation owner in Macon, Georgia, and she became pregnant with my great-grandmother, Susie, whom she hated and treated badly. And Susie had this bad life. I mean, she had four children, three stillborn, and then she had my grandmother, Mary. Now, my grandmother was a four foot 11 firecracker. <laughs> she raised four kids by herself in the South because she was a fighter. Her three daughters were all challenged in life, and her only son was raised by a friend until she could get her feet on the ground. But then everybody moved up north. And that's where she started to break the cycle of being a victim. She got a job. She bought her own house. She made sure that all the kids got educated on some level. And when she was in her late 40s, she went to nursing school and she became a licensed practical nurse. She even made care packages for soldiers. Now, my mother, Susan, the second one from your left, she wanted a better life too, but we were on welfare. And she worked menial jobs. She had this thing, she wouldn't have called it this, but it was a mantra, become educated. So it's not a surprise, I went through two master's degree programs and my brother has a degree in computer science. And given our family history, it's also not surprising that we had this family script of scare tactics. Life is hard. You have to fight if you want to get anywhere. You have to work hard if you want to make it. Make yourself invaluable, because you're not safe. You can't trust anyone. You're a Negro in America. So be quiet, act like a lady, and do not make any trouble. So you might have heard some things similar to that growing up, but I'm here to tell you that your past does not define you. Everybody's got a story with good news and interesting news. But we all can rewrite the story if that's what we want to do. But first, you have to know the truth of the story, and then you shift it. So I came on the planet with a lot of energy and curiosity, even though my family was challenged. And I'm a creative. So I sang. I made up stories. I danced. And at 12 years old, I'm looking at this Betty Davis movie, and I'm struck. That's what I want to do. I want to act. It did not dawn on me that Betty Davis wasn't black. <laughs> I just knew I wanted to shine. And I wanted to be more than the queen of my church. And my grandmother saw me. She saw me. She loved me. She wanted to, to, to take care of me. And she knew I wanted to act, so she took me to see plays where I could see black people acting. And she became my biggest fan years later when I was an actress. So at age 30, I'm a working actress in Hollywood. And I, I'm loving it, but it's hard. I have a lot of odd jobs. I'm, I'm taking classes, second guessing myself, insecure, wondering and doubting myself, and sometimes sabotaging myself. But eventually, I get a job on a soap opera, Days of Our Lives. <laughs> and I finally have enough money to go to therapy. <laughs> and that was a game changer for me. So in therapy, I learned three techniques to rewrite my story. Create healthy neural pathways, examine and revise negative self-talk, and have self-care be a priority. 
So my therapist was non-traditional, and he taught me to look at, at life from a new perspective. He introduced the concept of neural pathways, which made me curious. So I started reading everything I could about neuroscience. And I learned that thinking habits, behaviors, release positive and negative chemicals that create neural pathways. And when you learn something new, your neurons communicate, making a new synaptic connection in your neocortex, your thinking brain. So the more positive you think, the more positive chemicals get released, like dopamine, serotonin, they call them bliss hormones. And a thought is nothing but energy and information. So I decided I was gonna change my thoughts and my behaviors. I taught myself to sit down, to breathe, to scan my body, and I journaled what was happening in my body anytime I was upset or, or, or negative. You know, what was happening was my body tight in my neck, in my shoulders, in my stomach. And then I wrote down what kind of life I wanted, and I was really specific. If you don't want to write, you can dictate into your phone. It's just as effective. I also am visual. So I created a vision board that had pictures and words and phrases that mirrored my desire. I needed to look at something every single day that was going to make me understand my intention. And it didn't happen overnight, but eventually I began to see life with a new lens. So I'm sitting with my therapist, and I hear myself with negative self-talk. And I realized I am reiterating the kitchen wisdom from my childhood, and I needed to change it. So I got serious about my self-talk, because those old family phrases would creep in, plus ones I had picked up along the way, so I needed an antidote. But the hard part was catching myself in the middle of the negative phrase and changing it, because I could hear my grandmother's voice and her kitchen phrases, and I needed to counter it. Be quiet, act like a lady, don't make no trouble. And I would say, I have a voice. I I I'm here to use it. You have to work hard to make it. No, life can be easy. I'm smart and I'm powerful. You not safe. I am safe and I can protect myself you can't trust no one. I can trust myself. And I deserve to be successful. And I said those phrases every morning, every night, throughout the entire day. And when negative things would come in, I would say no. And I would bring in a positive statement. You know, you could sit at your kitchen table and think about the phrases you heard as a child and write new antidote affirmations. In the 1980s, black activist and poet Audre Lorde wrote a series of essays and journal entries about self-care. And she said, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. So in all the generations of my family, the women left ill, overweight, depressed, and they didn't know how to take care of themselves. They had heart challenges, diabetes, paranoid behavior was prevalent. And at 50, I was 30 pounds heavier than I am today. And I didn't like where I was headed. My adrenals were shot from overwork and I wasn't motivated. I didn't know how to take care of myself. So I'm sitting in this class and I hear this woman talk about radical self-care. And I think, oh. That's what I need. So that became my focus, to love and honor myself and to make self-care a priority. So I changed my dietary habits. I cleaned out the pantry, the refrigerator, brought in healthy food with the help of a nutritionist. I had to get serious about exercise. So I hired a trainer. I worked out three to four times a week. And then I had to quiet my mind. So I learned to meditate, and I meditate every morning. 
I also needed positive input. So I listened to podcasts and I listened to positive talks. I'm here to tell you I'm living proof that you can rewrite your story and create the life of your dreams. No matter where you are or what you've been through, you have the power within you to create a new reality and it's never too late. So today, I sit at my kitchen table and I honor my legacy, I honor my history. But my children have new kitchen wisdom. <laughs> they have learned about possibility. Tonight, I encourage you to sit at your table, think about your stories, think about your antidotes, think about your scripts and what self-care could look like for you. Because this is what I know, that you can change your life at any given moment. No story, no history, no past can define anyone's future. You get to choose. Thank you.